But if you've ever tried to explain a viral tweet to someone who's not on Twitter, they will stop you. Yeah. They will desperately try to stop you. I believe I once attempted to explain being dead to someone, and I think I got out those two words, and I was like, I, I'm going to go outside. We're just going to pretend this didn't happen. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest this week is Jane Koston, host of The Argument and columnist at The New York Times. Jane's written some excellent pieces in The Times, not only about why we all need to get over Twitter, but how to grapple with our extremely online existence, including a fascinating argument about the gamification of our online debates and how that's affecting everything from politics to culture to sports. Beyond Twitter, Jane and I also talked about shifting ideas of elitism in the United States, why we should pay more attention to the NFL and shows like NCIS, and why she thinks former high school debaters have destroyed our online discourse. Here's Jane Koston. Jane Koston, welcome to Offline. Thank you so much for having me. I've been meaning to have you on for a while because um, I could tell from your writing and from our conversations that you too believe that our extremely online existence is probably doing us more harm than good, uh, especially those of us who spend time on social media, and especially those of us who spend time on Twitter. Is that a fair characterization? Right. That is correct. Uh, I would also note that I joined Twitter in June 2008. I am broken inside. <laughs> um, realizing, like, oh, I've been on here for 14 years. Like, I, you know, it's, you start talking about things. Like, remember when Twitter used to just be, like, talking about what you had for lunch, and then it just became this, like, organ of agony ah memories what have those 14 years been like I, I i know that you you've written about this and you said that uh those 14 years have been meaningful but you're not sure why <laughs> right no um i would say there are a couple of things here first and foremost i will never log off um i actually quite enjoy twitter but i think that that's because i am and i always try to work on this is to realize what twitter is mm. twitter is not America or the world. Twitter is not like, I'm aware that most of the things I talk about on Twitter have no relevance, even to what I discuss most, which is sports on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, there is this real, um, and the, I used to cover college football in the NFL, and there is like this way that people, I mean, it's the same thing with politics. There's a way that people on Twitter talk about football that then you talk to people who either play in college, coach in college, play in the NFL, coach in the NFL, and they're like, what on earth are you even talking about? I'm like, no, no, we are not okay. Um, yeah, it's very insidery. It's super insidery. And um, I'm reminded, and especially because um, I think Twitter tends to lend itself to an obsession with um, process and the performance of process. Then in sports, you talk to people who um, – I, I know someone who um, he played in the NFL and he was like, I didn't think as much about play calling when I was an NFL player, which keep in mind, when you're in the NFL, you are the top 0.5% of people who have ever played football. Like even just making it to the league for one season is amazing. He was like, Twitter people think about play calling and think about the processes of all of these things taking place in a way that people who do this do not. And I think that that, is, that also applies to how we talk about politics yeah. on Twitter. I was going to say, why do you think that, why do you think there's that focus on process? Because it's, it's sports, it's politics, it's uh, people who talk about the financial markets, it's people who right. talk about tech. It's like across all the different areas of, it's entertainment. <laughs> right. And I think that it happens because Twitter is very good at being a real-time platform, which is why anytime Twitter tries to do anything that makes it not chronological, everyone loses their minds. It is good at being a means by which you can observe something happening. The problem becomes that you can only see what you can see. For example, um, I'll, I'll use another sports example. If you go back to, say, like uh, the beginning of any season, there will be you know, games where you're like, wow, this team looks fantastic. They look great. And you are responding to a moment in time. You're mm. responding to a game in which it looks like this player or this team is unbeatable. Um, there's this joke 
on Twitter um, and other social media platforms that there are certain players in college who are like this. And we, you know, you call them like kind of the September Heisman candidates. Right. Like there is this era, there's weird couple of years in which Maryland football looked spectacular every September. And then by December it looked like hot trash. That, I mean, that's just the nature of how Maryland football is. But, <laughs> like, you can only see what you can see. And so you're looking at this process, and you're so, like, so focused on it. And Twitter kind of encourages that. And Twitter is not good at context. Twitter is not good at thinking ahead or thinking back. Every day there's some tweet that's like, I didn't know any of this happened until right now. It is, like... It is an amazing, it's like a tabula rasa, but for all of humanity, and it's the weirdest thing in the world. And so I think that process and the performance of process becomes this area of real obsession, specifically on Twitter. And I think that that's really bad for how we think about sports, because you get into like, why, you know, we won, but we only won by four. And then you don't know until the end of the season, that the team you beat by four was actually fantastic, or that you know, it, it turned out it didn't signify the downfall of civilization. But in politics, that means that you get really, you fetishize process, doing things, quote unquote, the right way. That the ideal would be that not only would your favorite political team pass legislation, but they do so and look awesome doing so. And so I think that that's why you see kind of like intro, like weirdo political Twitter gambits of like, you know, this tweet went viral. I'm like, no, it doesn't actually mean anything. Like, <laughs> there are lots of people. I mean, Mitch McConnell is a very effective politician, despite the entire Twitter online right hating him. Every six months, there's like some Mark Levin tweet about how Mitch McConnell is the big problem and blah, 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 blah. And every six months, Mitch McConnell is like, I don't care. I'm in charge here. He does all, you know, he does what he does. The process does not look the way that online right people would want it to look, but it gets done. And so I think that one of the things we have is that Twitter is now not just a means in which we are observing the performance of politics or sports or culture, but we are interacting with that performance and demanding it be performed in a way that we want it to be, even if it doesn't result in anything. Yeah. No, this 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 happens in politics all the time. I mean, we used to call it like like, like the optics police when we were in the Obama <laughs> White House, um, and so everything is about optics, and uh, very little is about substance. I mean, I was trying to parse this out just recently, thinking about sort of the Biden administration's reaction to Dobbs, because mm -hmm. I was trying to separate my criticism because I'm like, okay, there's criticism of the substantive reaction, like what executive actions haven't they taken that they'd be able to take? Like what right. legislation could they try to pass that they haven't tried to pass? Well, you can't do it because you got mansion and cinema, blah, blah, blah. And then right. there is like, he did not sort of perform the right. appropriate rage, which I didn't think he did. Cause like I would have been angrier if I was president, I would have given a fire, more fiery speech. And then I'm right. like, what would that, what would that have achieved? And then, then, you, then you think nothing. you're like, absolutely nothing. <laughs> but then you're in politics and you're like, but you know that that's what gets you the good news cycle. So do it. <laughs> so do it's like everyone, like you, the performance is necessary to like get people going. But we're all, are we all just like waiting for the performance for what? For us to feel? Yes, yes to we are. We are waiting for the performance of outrage, the performance of something where, and I, I think that that gets... That's, you know, I, I don't like the term problematic because I think it's gotten overused, but mm. I think it, it actually is concerning when you want to hear f from politicians, you want to hear yourself. I mean, it's understandable. You want to hear your anger, your ire reflected. And it does feel good when you and when it you does. hear that, it feels good. You know, like when that when when Mallory McMorrow, that, that Michigan state right. senator gave that speech and it went viral, it went viral because. I watched it and I was like, fuck yeah. That's why I wanted yeah, someone to say exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. And she's in a, you know, a tough race, but it's more that her performance of that was very well done. But it is more important, you know, it's more important of what that performance then results in. Like, does it result in her winning her election? I think that there have been, um, and this is another you know, kind of Twitter performance thing, like, if you have, there's this thing that happens in which if you have a viral ad 
thread mm. or a viral speech or something, you just can count on all of this money coming in, even if it is purely performative. And I mean that as all ads are performative. All, like, all of this is performance in some ways. But like, when you so disconnect performance from like actually doing things, I think that that is where you, you kind of run into big trouble. And that's why I think like some of the most effective politicians right now are, one, not on the federal level. Mm -hmm. They're at the state level. And two, they are the ones who are like, they just do things and then they do them and then no one really talks about it because the thing is done. Um, I always use the example of uh, Danica Rome in Virginia. Yeah. Who um, she's a trans woman. She's a, you know a pretty popular politician in Virginia because she recognized something that Virginia bo- voters really care about: the roads are trash. Oh my god! And so when she ran a couple of years ago, she ran on essentially like this intersection is bad. We should fix it. Which is like yes, that's a political problem that people can solve. Yeah. That is a a problem that can be solved by politics. I think that. We get into trouble when we want politicians to solve problems that cannot be solved by politics, even though those politicians love those problems because it's perfect. It's like how, um, like there are ho- you know there are a host of kind of right wing figures who are basically running on the imp- implication that if they were elected, nobody would be gay anymore, like right, that they yeah. could just like stop it, like oh vote for me and we'll end the implication being like people will just stop being gay or trans. And I'm like, you know, barring um, actions that Pol Pot would have found a little excessive, that's not going to happen. But, like, the problems of culture in general cannot be solved by politics or the problems that you see in culture more, more accurately. And so I think, like, Twitter plays into this performance culture in which what is actually happening gets a little disconnected from how it looks when it's happening. Like, there's always that talk about, like, oh, you know, no one wants to see how the sausage is made. Well, part of that is because making sausage is actually incredibly boring. It's both gross and boring. It's boring, and I'll, I'll, I'll move away from the sausage metaphor yeah. for this, but, it's <laughs> the, but the, the actual work of politics and, and legislation and governing is not just, cannot just be, it's not just boring at times. It's also maddeningly frustrating and slow and comes with like a whole bunch of disappointments and setbacks because you're just dealing with a bunch of very complicated human beings that are all trying to like get something done together and if you've done that with five or six people it's tough let alone the number of people that are involved in governing anything right um right there's also sort of the disconnect i think and you've talked about this too like you you've argued that Twitter doesn't matter as much as we Twitter users Twitter users think it does. And I always make the case that the reason Twitter has outsized influence relative to its very small user base is because every journalist and politician in the world is on the platform. Like what do you right. what do you think about that? No, I, I think that that's that's true, which is interesting because then you get into the fact that it's journalists and politicians talking to other journalists and politicians. And um, right. there are a host of people who it's like, <sighs> on a list of things, I, if I could change anything, it would just be like, I don't want to hear about any politician's tweets ever again. Um, <laughs> the last time we had to spend a lot of time thinking about a politician's tweets for like professional reasons, he, he has since been removed from the platform. And I believe he has some truthy, socially other platform that I don't need to know about or care. Yeah, but he may perform his way back into uh, both I mean, Twitter honestly, and but, like, that was in the White what House. He, <laughs> that was what he was best at, is this performance of being Donald Trump. That's um, right. Because it, it's interesting when you think back about it, and it just is like the performance of Donald Trump and who Donald Trump actually was um, and is are very different things. But uh, yeah, I think that because you know, journalists and politicians are on Twitter. You obviously want to believe that the thing you're using all the time is incredibly important. And it kind of is because I think that, I mean, we've seen again and again that there are stories that you hear about on Twitter and then it winds up being like a bunch of people talking about it. Sometimes I think that that's based on on reality. Um, I think that the, I mean, the Ahmad Arbery murder is not 
charged. It nothing happens with it if it doesn't garner social media attention. Right. Um, George Floyd's murder. Correct. Nothing that becomes a police involved death. If you go back to the original press release that um, Minneapolis police put out about that when that first happened, it none of that happens without social media attention. And I think that that's incredibly worthwhile because you have people reacting to an event that is taking place and sharing it. And that's real. That's the same reason if you were on Twitter in like 2011, you remember the Arab Spring, like, which I think, but then I think that that leads to the problem here, which is that one events that happen on Twitter are not important off Twitter. Um, have, if you've ever tried to explain, I mentioned, I think in my writing that if you've ever tried to explain a viral tweet to someone who's not on Twitter, they will stop you. Yeah. They will desperately try to stop you. You, you might stop yourself because as you try to explain that viral tweet, I've done this, I've done it. I've gone home and talked to my wife and been like, Hey, so there was this thing on Twitter today that happened. And she's like, well, and then I, halfway through, I'm like, I sound like a fucking moron right now. Can oh, yeah. Describe this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I believe I once attempted to explain being dead to someone. And I think I got out those two words. And I was like, I, I'm going to go outside. We're just going to pretend this I didn't miss happen. being dead. And I asked someone nope, about nope. that. And, and halfway through nope. the explanation, I was like, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I don't follow. I don't follow the being nope, dead nope, problem. No, nope, I don't nope, know what's going nope. on right now. You're out. Totally out. <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, I think that there is, Twitter can be very helpful when you were talking about events that are actually taking place in the world. And you see a host of people attempting to either garner opinion or observe opinions. And then those opinions will become kind of, you, you see those opinions move outside the platform over at, in real time. But then when Twitter is talking about itself, it is the epicenter of hell. Um, oh, yeah. Like, so you can totally understand why journalists are on there. Sometimes I don't quite understand why politicians are on there, especially because you have politicians who's... I think they're on there because the journalists are on there. Yeah, the journalists are on there, and they want the attention from journalists because that's how any of this works. But I just keep thinking, like, if you are voting in the district of many of the people who are, like, the loudest on Twitter... I don't know if you're not on Twitter, what do you know about that? Like there are people who are in Congress who on Twitter have these very like specific personalities. And then you look at like their actual campaign websites and it's just like, he opened a park. He signed a bill. He appeared with this Boy Scout troop. And you're like, it's this an entirely different performance of politics for the people who probably actually are more likely to vote. Yeah, I mean, I think the benefit of a politician being on Twitter and, and, and building a Twitter profile that is broadly popular is, most importantly, the attention you get from journalists and then also the attention you get from activists. And right. now most of these donations are from like small dollar donors who are like right. activists as well and the people who p pay most attention to politics. And so you can build you can build a national profile as a politician fairly quickly by being a good tweeter because you're going to get press from that you're going to get donations from that and then you're going to get the activists who pay most attention to politics really liking you now what it will do in an actual district where you have to run and win is a different story which is also by the way why you get a lot of these like sort of rising star democratic politicians who are in sort of these like tougher red states or or, or red districts and then they can't win there and then you're like well what's next right <laughs> i'm aware that Running campaigns is very, very hard, but I actually think that it's very useful um, to, if you, if I were to offer advice to campaigns, um, you know, at the, you know, at the state level, I would say like, be as offline as you can possibly be. Um, I remember during the, the Roy Moore camp, uh, special election in Alabama, um, I, I maintain that part of uh, Doug Jones's effectiveness was that he did not do, he did not really meet with journalists. You had to come to Alabama and go to a fish fry. And if you did not want to go to a fish fry, you could not speak to Doug Jones. And meanwhile, Roy Moore, you know, wandered around with little pistols. And then, um, you know, a lot happened with regard to that campaign. But, like, <laughs> there is something to say about, like, keeping local campaigns local and also being aware, and I think Democrats need to be more aware, that, like, if your campaign get garners national attention, yes, you're bringing in a ton of money. But, like, 
what does that actually mean for your race, especially when make garner, garnering the attention of the nation can actually, you know, come to bite you in the ass. Which, I, I mean, I'm aware that, like, on the one hand, you'd be like, well, I'll just take the money anyway. So, like, I know it's hard. No, but it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you, you've argued in the past that, um, that one of the problems with Donald Trump's campaign in 2020 and one of the reasons he may have ultimately lost <laughs> is that he was – he became way too online and that and when he was at his rallies he was saying things that were so like in the weeds you have to be a like a, a, a not just a twitter user but like a, a rabid twitter user right you have to be me yeah. i you, <laughs> you have, have to be, be me, me. Or and me, yeah. even there were times um when I wrote about that uh, it was right after he'd done a, a campaign um event i think in iowa and he started talking about nelly and bruce orr yep and I remember being like, I've written on like the Fusion GPS. Even talking about this, I'm like, what even were we talking about? I don't like, even know. I could, no, I could not no, tell you the no. whole story about Nelly and Bruce Orr and Fusion no, GPS. No, and I no, probably tweeted no about it a million times. I have no idea no, what it was about anymore. Absolutely no idea. It just <laughs> left your brain because your brain was like, you don't need to know this. Um, but he was talking about, and he would just say things like, well, what about Nelly Orr? Huh? <laughs> and like, wait for applause. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is the most online person who has ever lived. And I say that as being an extremely online person. Um, when I say being extremely online, I don't mean like connected to the Internet. I mean, believing that like the events that take place on Twitter or what's important on Twitter or social media in general are like super important to everyone. So, I, you know, I, under I care a lot about Section 230, the Communications Decency Act of 1996, one of the great laws we have. And I understand why Trump cared a lot, but like I cannot imagine going to like South Carolina and starting to yell about Section 230, which is, you know, this is stuff he did. And so there I, you know, as I wrote at the time, there were a host of conservatives who were like in 2016, he was talking about like the working class and how they were, you know, no one cared about them. And then in 2020, it was like the beautiful boaters, suburban housewives and shit you would only know about. If you were incredibly online, deep in the comment section at Breitbart, <laughs> just extremely deep. And I've been in the comment section at Breitbart. And there were moments where like that, that idea of kind of picking out random care. It was like the return of special characters on a television show, but characters you totally forgot about. Yep. Like at a certain point, you know, if you know who this is, maybe that says more about you than it does about like everyone else in the world. Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. Tommy, share any summer memories you've had where you enjoyed Blue Moon or any upcoming summer plans that you have. I think Blue Moon is maybe the perfect baseball game beer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very refreshing. It's not one of those. It you was know, born in a ballpark, you know. Right. It's not one of those like super light beers that actually tastes like kind of. No, there's gross a, water. There's a delicious citrusy, orangey flavor. That yeah, makes it makes it. Yeah, delicious. I'd like to go to a Red Sox game. But it doesn't feel heavy. And have a bunch of blue moons, and then chant Yankees suck, even though we're playing like the Orioles. You just you always have to chant Yankees right, suck, yeah. just in case. Cool. So it's just so people that know people yeah. know. Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat and Tropical Wheat are two refreshingly light citrusy wheat beers, checking in at just 95 calories per 12 ounces. Both beers are bright and crisp with a twist of citrus. Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat is brewed with real tangerine peel, and Blue Moon Light Sky Tropical Wheat is brewed with pineapple and orange peel. Get Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Sweet and Light Sky Tropical Wheat delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline. Blue Moon Light Sky, savor every sip. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Offline is brought to you by Base Paws. Base Paws is the number one cat DNA test that helps cat parents learn more about their cat's breed and health. Base Paws developed the world's most advanced genetic tools to help you make informed choices in caring for your cat's health. Using a world-class feline genomic database, Base Paws can trace your cat's breed type and origins. Their breed influences their personality traits and, most importantly, hereditary genetic health conditions. We had three cats growing up. Pansy, Snooper, Mouse. Don't I, you wish you could have known? I would love to have learned more about their origin story. Well, now you can with Base Paws. Hannah really wants to get a cat, and I'm kind of like fending it off. Wow, really? Yeah, I just I'm not quite ready. Well, if you get one, you know where to go. Base pause. It's as easy as one, two, three. One, register your kit. Two, swab the inside of your cat's mouth for five to ten seconds. Three, send your sample to Base Pause using the prepaid mailer. Your report will include your cat's breed, dental health score, vital information about their health, and much more. So don't wait. Get peace of mind about your cat's health by visiting basepause.com and ordering your cat DNA kit today. 
That's B-A-S-E-P-A-W-S dot com and use the code OFFLINE30 to get $30 off your first order. Make sure to visit BasePaws.com and get $30 off by using the code OFFLINE30. BasePaws, better lives, lived longer. I mean, just to zoom out on this a little bit, like Mm -hmm. there's this very public, constant conversation among elites on Twitter. And and Mm -hmm. like you said, first of all, Twitter... I mean, one of the benefits of Twitter is that it has, it has like sort of opened the gates to a broader set of voices, a more diverse set of voices, people who don't have platforms. Mm-hmm. And because of that, people have been able to create social and political change, right? So that's like an, a, a very good thing about Twitter. But there's also happening every day on Twitter this constant public conversation among political and media elites that most of the public not only doesn't participate in, but doesn't even follow. Like, what effect do you think that has on our politics in general? Oh, I think it's it makes politics seem like a fun game for people, which is mm. actually, I think that, um, I believe uh, some people refer to it as kind of political hobbyism. Yeah. And it drives me insane. The reason to care about politics is, one, it's the thing we do together. And two, it's the means by which we assume that laws are passed and you try to do something that is going to make life better or at least neutral for more people Mm -hmm. like think about it if you if you live in an apartment building you the politics is basically like your elevator is broken you live in an apartment building that has like 12 floors you would like your elevator to get fixed politics is the means by which the elevator is to be fixed because you all you know you work with constituents who might be like, well, I also want this other thing to be fixed. And you're like, oh, okay, fine, cool. But is it, you know, can we prioritize getting the elevator fixed? And then I promise that in another sooner time, we will work on your thing about how the grills don't work on the roof. <laughs> this is also because the grills on my apartment roof do not work and it drives me nuts. <laughs> anyway, um, so like politics is this action, but the, the result of politics should be that the elevator is fixed or the bridge is fixed or that the thing happens. Political hobbyism turns the politics into the point when it isn't. Mm. Like there are a host of, um, and I think that this contributes to having a host of politicians who are very well known on a national level right now who have never passed a goddamn thing. They have co-sponsored things that purposely are like, I co-sponsored this thing that I know will never pass but I can say that I did it. That's pol- like that is participating in politics, but you aren't actually participating in like it would be like if you competed in a marathon, but the objective was not to finish. And so I think that the way that Twitter encourages political hobbyism in which you have politicians who become very well known because of how they seem to, you know, you either love them on Twitter or you hate them on Twitter or you are uh, something in between. It has nothing to do with their actual effectiveness at getting legislation passed, which is actually the point of politics. Like when people say that, oh, I went into politics to make America a better place. You did not say that because you thought that like the endless grind of politics was the point. You said that it was because like there's this park near my house and no one ever empties the trash. So I ran for city council so that I could scream at the garbage people and demand that they take out the trash at the park near my house. Yeah. You did not do so because you thought that the process of that was fun. You did it because you wanted the end result. You know, it's funny. I've been doing these uh, focus groups for another podcast I'm doing called The Wilderness. And uh, in every group of voters, I ask, uh, what issues do you think aren't getting enough attention in the media and politics and which issues do you think are getting too much attention and not getting enough attention is almost always cost of living issues, right? It's Mm -hmm. rent, it's uh, inflation, it's gas, you know, like even though that they are getting attention, but like no one's doing anything about all these cost of living issues. And when I say which issues are getting too much attention, the issue that they all name is politics, (laughs) Right. right? Because they say all that we get coverage of, all that we see is just people fighting all the time about politics Mm -hmm. and all the issues that affect our lives, whether it's inflation, whether it's abortion, whether it's anything, nothing seems to get done about any of these things. But when we see politics, it's all a discussion about 
politics. <laughs> and so this politics now becomes something different than what politics actually should be, which is fig com people coming together and figuring out a way to solve all those other problems that people are concerned right, about. Right, exactly. Like, politics is the means by which you would find a solution to inflation mm -hmm. um, that exists that I don't know. Um, <laughs> it would be the means by which you would find the solution or the compromise or the something to the problem. Politics is not just like, there. I mean, that's why I kind of hate, like, there's a, a style of reporting that is constantly like, Yo, this person's yelling at this person, but this person's yelling at this person. And I'm like, but wh wh why? Like, over what? To do what? What's the point? Why are we all here? And so I think that that's something that really, if you are not, like, if the political process does not get you hot and bothered, congratulations, you're like 90% of Americans. Right. There are 10% of Americans who liked the West Wing and didn't find it overbearing and infuriating and for those people well you can watch any number of those episodes whenever you'd like but like if you find you know if you want politics to actually do something for you rather than just be like you know this process by which people have discussions and kind of like i think that there are people who are like there's the there really is such a focus on process and such no focus on ends or means. Yeah. And I think that that contributes to not just people being overwhelmed by politics and the nature of it, but also it contributes to poorly written legislation where you have legislation that is meant to respond to like people being upset about something on Twitter but then it, at no point during the writing of this where you're like, well, what are the knock-on effects of this? What does this actually mean? Yeah. You know, you responded to people who were equally obsessed with process and had not thought about ends or means. And then you have legislation that it's like, good news, you banned this thing. Bad news, um, the penalty for that ban means that uh, somebody's going to get choked to death because they were selling those cigarettes. But, you know... You win some and some people die sometimes. And so I think that there really is a disconnect between the, you know, the people who fetishize process and the point of politics, which is not process. Like if we could solve disputes and, you know, and compromise faster without anyone watching us do so or without needing to be the person who has the, the segment that goes viral or needing to person, be the person who says the craziest thing you can imagine, that would be great. I mean, that's not the world we live in. Right. But, like, the end is the point. Trying to fix the elevator or solve inflation or deal with rising rent costs or even answer questions about, like, what would it mean to deal with rising rent costs? Is there something that would happen? Would you, if you capped rent prices, would that mean that there'd be fewer buildings? How does that intersect with fights for affordable housing, which is a thing people say that they would like to do? I think that that also, um, you, you get a real sense that there are people who support things, and then you ask them, like, well, what about this thing? And then they're like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the point here. And so <laughs> I think that... Um, yeah, it's it's bad. It's bad. Political hobbyism is bad. Well, I also think I think the internet has made all of this worse because it gives everyone a window into all these conversations and debates that are happening that seem like they are close to you, that seem like you can participate and 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 influence them, but but you really can't because they're actually further away. And there's also this this elite conversation going on like I remember last year you wrote this piece about how sort of elite circles online and in the media often ignore what's popular with most Americans, like the NFL or shows like right. NCIS. Yes. I, I was very, um, I'm very proud to say that uh, I am one of the numerous people who watches the NFL and I've seen numerous episodes of NCIS Hawaii. Um, Wildly popular with most of the country. I know, I know. Also uh, could contribute to why people are constantly surprised about um, either federal law enforcement or state law enforcement failing to do something. Because if you watch CBS cop shows, the cops are the fucking best. Yeah. They are all. <laughs> they're hot. They're strong. <laughs> they're fighting for, you know, they're fighting against evil. Like, they're work you know, they're standing up to the man, even though they themselves are the man. But there's always somebody above them who's trying to tell them what to do. And they're like, well, I'm sorry, but I just can't do that. Like, 
it's you know I, the world of CBS cops is that if that's what you think law enforcement is, I understand no why wonder. you are just a lot of American politics makes it a lot more sense. But yet, like you do get um, disconnected from how most people think about things, and I think that there's it's not that most people are correct. I think that that's really important to get at. Like I'm reminded there was a Vox article from a couple of months ago that um, essentially, I think it said something like, everyone knows that Lin-Manuel Miranda is tired and awful. And everyone was like, wait, what? Encanto just came, like everybody, lo- like people love Lin-Manuel, people who have opinions about Lin- Lin-Manuel Miranda, like pretty big fans. And so there's something about like taking, the, you know, you wind up in a Pauline Kael situation. Um, Pauline Kael, who famously said something akin to that like, you know, she didn't know anyone who voted for Nixon. Mm. Um, it, the actual quote is not nearly as bad as I think it was generally reported to be. But anyway, like, you wind up in this situation in which you take your bubble as sacrosanct. Yeah. But I would also say that it's important to recognize that sometimes, and I, I know this conservatives doing this all the time, like, when they have the polling, they'll use the polling. But when they don't have the polling, they're like, the polling doesn't matter. Of course, yeah. You know, we're just correct. Tried and true trick. And, like, you know, there are there are multiple issues on which... I'm aware I'm out of step with American opinion. And I'm like, yeah, well, most Americans are just wrong on this particular issue. Sorry, that's just how it is. But, like, that's called, you know, being yeah. a person. And that's well, but how you can at least works. be aware. You can I'm be aware, aware there's some issues well that you're in the majority and some issues you're yeah. not. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's how it works. And I think I think that Twitter sometimes lends itself to being like, no, 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 I am in the majority. Oh, of rather course. Rather than having... Rather than having the tools to talk about how, like, I'm not in the majority, so my job is to stand strong for my viewpoints while either trying to convince the wider world of my view or just being like, well, that's just that's just how it is. I mean, I do wonder if constantly being exposed to media coverage and conversations about the lives of cultural, political, financial elites makes the politics of grievance and resentment an easier sell, which is clearly a problem that we are all facing right now as we are beset with right-wing populists here in the United States and all over the world. Yeah, and I think that it also... um, I wrote a piece uh, a while back about the idea of elites because I actually kind of hate that concept because I think that sometimes... Well, both sides use the word for for the other side, of course. Right, you know. right, exactly. Um, in general, when I'm talking about elites, I try to refer to either people with like overwhelming cultural power or rich people. Mm. Like if you are... Um, I wrote about it in the context of um, uh, Indiana University had a basketball coach who was bad. I liked him because he was bad, um, but they were basically like, it's, you know, Indiana University did not have the money to fire him. They could not pay his buyout. That buyout was like more than $10 million because this is Indiana University basketball and they still believe in that as a thing. You know, it's like, yeah. congratulations on, you know, your belief in the 1980s. But anyway, um, and so, you know, two boosters came in. One paid the $10 million buyout and the other covered the cost to buy find a new basketball coach. Mm-hmm. And I essentially argued, like, if you can pay $10 million to make a basketball coach you don't like go away, you are an elite. Yeah, 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 you qualify. There was a great Atlantic piece a while back about kind of this, like, um, American gentry, the people who own, like, multiple car dealerships. They didn't go to Harvard or Yale. They probably went to, like... Dayton or IU or they you know they went to like University of Wisconsin Whitewater but and they're but they're rich like they don't go to Europe for vacation but they go to Destin like three times a year and they own a house there and they are the people who are driving small town politics they are the people who are like I threw my support behind this sheriff and that sheriff determines whether or not your town basically becomes a speed trap to collect tickets and in you know have more contact with law enforcement. And so I think that Twitter enables us to put a window on you know whether financial elites or how however you think of being cultural elites, but it also puts up a wall. Yeah. Because you start thinking that like a 17-year-old at NYU with a big TikTok profile is more important or more elite than, like, you know, Josh Hawley, who, one, 
has a lot of political power, but two, also like, you know, he went to Stanford and he taught in England. Like he did a lot of elite things. Yeah, no, it's, it is a, it is often a contest politics now between Republicans trying to make the argument that Democrats are cultural elites, uh, academic elites, um, and Democrats trying to make the argument, at least we used to, that Republicans are sort of economic and financial elites. <laughs> But but now but this this new populism on the right is trying to say also that because, you know, because a lot of more socially liberal, economically well off people are now Democrats. And that includes like, you know, the tech industry and the financial industry and that stuff like that. Then then Democrats are the real elites. Right. That that's basically right, that's exactly. the basis and for it, right wing populism at this point. And it's interesting about how you're dueling over who is more elite. It's kind of like um, <laughs> we have this moment in which everyone wants to simultaneously be powerful and a victim. And which I'm like, no, like, just admit that, like, you have, I have power. Like, John, you and I have power in a distinct way. People, for some unholy reason, listen to us and pay attention to the things we say. That's great. Like, we should probably not urge, like, a junta or, like, you know, demand people kill each other. Probably shouldn't. Yeah. That would be, that would be bad. <laughs> and if we were to do so and then say, like, no, 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 it doesn't matter because we don't have power, like... I would, one, that would be trash, and we would get sued, and that would be very bad. <laughs> but, like, if we can acknowledge our cultural power, I think people who are, one, who with political power, should acknowledge that, like, yes, being a member of Congress is a seat of actually quite immense power. You are supposed to be able to declare war. Do you remember that thing where we used to, like, ask Congress to yeah. declare war? Yeah, I remember. Was, yeah, that was back in the day. <sighs> the old days. Um, but, like... <laughs> You are supposed to, you know, I think if people were better at understanding that, like, trying to foist power off on the other and then talk about how great things would be if you had power, but in this weird way, you can never have the power, so you never have to take responsibility for it. That's, that's a bad state of affairs. Offline is brought to you by NetSuite. This is it. The putt to win the tournament. Uh -oh. If you sink it, the championship is yours. Oh, my God. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. What the f That is quite a journey. Is this about the this British is, Open and Rory McIlroy? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. Okay. That's what it's about. Sure. NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite's the number one cloud financial system that gives you the full picture of your business. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR planning, budgeting, and more, NetSuite's everything you need all in one place. You can automate your manual processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Neil, our CFO, mm -hmm. And Kelly, our senior director of finance, used NetSuite here at Crooked Media. And they nail their putts. They nail every putt. They are ice cold on the greens. <laughs> they invoice directly out of NetSuite so they're able to leverage AR aging reports to keep track of our account receivables. We get paid in those big checks. We don't even know what those words mean. Like after tournaments. That's why, that's why we need Neil and Kelly. That's right. And that's accurate, actually. Over 31,000 businesses already use NetSuite. This summer, NetSuite has a special financing program for those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash offline. Head to netsuite.com slash offline for this special one-of-a-kind financing offer on the number one financial system for growing businesses. netsuite.com slash offline. Offline is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Who doesn't love cereal? The crunch, the sweetness, the way you act can accidentally eat a whole box or sneak it as a midnight snack. Magic Spoon has truly innovated and changed the game with sugary cereals. They spent time to perfect the crunchy texture and develop an astounding variety of flavors so that they always hit the spot but without any of the things that are bad for you. Magic Spoon is packed with protein and a great healthy snack for just about anyone, whether after a workout, during a hike, or at midnight when the cravings strike. There's a flavor for everyone, from the richest chocolate to the sweetest honey nut. They got zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. It's low-carb, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and only 140 calories a serving. You can build your own box with a huge variety of appealing flavors. They've got classics like cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. The cult favorites like blueberry muffin, maple waffle, and honey nut. And the indulgent ones like cookies and cream and cinnamon roll. I'm a classics guy. Me too. Call me boring, but I, they just can't beat those four flavors. 
I also like the cookies and cream, too. I do think that's delicious. Okay. Go to magicspoon.com slash cricket to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And be sure to use our promo code cricket at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon's so confident in their product. It's back with 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash cricket and use the code crooked to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. I want to ask you about another online problem that you've mm-hmm. recently written about, and you, you just alluded this uh, alluded to this when we were talking about um, everyone thinking that they're always right on Twitter and that you don't need to persuade anyone, um, mm-hmm. which is what the internet has done to the quality of our conversations. You call it debate team energy. Can you explain debate oh. team energy? Uh, sorry. Sorry. That was just, I, I, even I'm the person who came up with the idea of debate <laughs> team energy and even thinking about it makes me mad. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I want to be clear that there are people who emailed me being like, no, 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 I was on debate team. And I'm like, yeah, I can tell by the fact that you're emailing me right now <laughs> to defend your, um, debate team prowess. But like, if you've ever competed or witnessed a debate competition, you're, you know, you're well aware that like the best argument does not win. Mm. Like, I have witnessed debate team competitions in which people have won uh, for terrible arguments. And that's totally fine. You're trying to score points. That's the whole point of it. Yeah, debate. you're trying to score points. Literally, it is, a, it is a game. And if you are, if that is how you approach politics, then at a certain point, you, know, you are more focused on, the, on gamifying conversation than you are on the point of conversation which is to garner information or to, um, you know, to get somewhere to, you know, the point of, I mean, I call it kind of academic team energy. I competed in an academic team, which is because I'm exactly the kind of person who you think I am. Um, and the point of that was one, having a large storehouse of generally useless knowledge, but also you're sort of like, you're answering questions you're not trying to beat the other team into submission. You're just like, I know things that you do not know. And when I win this debate, this uh, academic team com- uh, competition, you will probably go home and Google those things. And then you will know those things. Well, it's al- and it's also partly saying like, and I don't know certain things, right? Like there's a vulnerability to conversation that results in knowledge in which you right. admit that like you don't know everything, you ask questions that might sound awkward, you make mistakes, right. um, you reveal you reveal your own ignorance uh, among right. uh, on certain topics, and these are all things that we do in casual conversation that are okay. But when you're on Twitter and it's a performance, like it's about you got to fucking win, because <laughs> otherwise you're gonna get dunked on, and then that's that. <laughs> yeah, and then they'll make like YouTube clips that are like how blah 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 destroyed blah blah blah, and you're like you don't even know like what. <laughs> Um, and so again, it's like, it goes back to our earlier conversation about performance in which debate team is about performance. Like people do not really care what you were winning on. Like you can win in a debate competition on any number of things, but if you perform that argument correctly, you can do really well. And so I think that that kind of energy, especially the people who are very good at it, where they talk really fast and they're really loud and they ask a lot of kind of like gotcha questions and they're but there's never an expectation that they could themselves be incorrect. Right. Like the, the lack of vulnerability, I think that's a really good point. Like if you don't know something, I always say like, just say that you don't know because that vulnerability provides an opening hopefully for some sort of actual conversation. You know, you, I really think that the debate team energy means that you try to paper, paper over not knowing something, but just screaming at people. I mean, I think for a long time that I mistakenly believed that Twitter was a place where you could potentially persuade other people with an effective argument. <laughs> but like, I don't know that if I, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone on Twitter respond to any argument with, hey, that's a good point. Never thought of it that way. I think that the closest I've come is, uh, and that's, I, I am the kind of person who is willing to do this because I don't know, I have a zen for pain. I don't get it. But like, I have had actual. I have witnessed actual changing of minds on Twitter. It has happened. I have wow. seen it done. And you also p- see people who are having long back and forth, where they both come out of it being like, "I better understand your position." I you know I have seen that a few times. I actually yeah. had this happen in my Twitter mentions, which are you know that's a place 
maybe not to go, but like <laughs> people having an actual conversation about abortion and coming away with it being like, I didn't understand this perspective beforehand, but now I do. Thank you. And I was like, I did it. I mean, I didn't do anything, but I did it. <laughs> um, you witnessed it at least. <laughs> I, I was, I, I witnessed you facilitated, it on my phone. Yeah. Yes. That's what we'll call it. I'm a facilitator of conversation. Um, but yeah, I think that that's the thing is also because vulnerability, like the, you know, Twitter was not made for vulnerability. It wasn't made for context. It was essentially made for real time reactions and for the concept of dunking on each other. Yeah. And I think that part of why I love talking about sports on Twitter is one, I have actually built up a large, a community of people who I've been talking about sports with now for 14 years. I've met some of them. We've talked like when I um, when I got married, I there was a Twitter friend who actually sent. Um, uh, I'm from Cincinnati, and we have an ice cream called Grater's Ice Cream. Oh yes, uh, my my wife's from Cincinnati, so I'm very familiar oh, with Grater's. So <laughs> um, I'm a huge Michigan fan, and this guy is like an Ohio State blogger. But he sent to my office. He was like, you know, I've got something for you, and I'm like, we've talked enough that I don't think you're a serial killer. And he sent to my office at the time. Like this whole delivery of Grater's ice cream for when I got married, and I was like, "That's great!" And like, it, it's it, one of Twitter sports world can actually be a place of like actual friendship and joy and enjoyment. Um, sometimes it's because like, I think it's because the you know you we all kind of recognize that sports is important. Sports is a, a portal to talk about wider things while also keeping it kind of small, but also like. It's a game. We know that. Like, we're aware of this. I have yeah. I have cried. Like, I have gotten physically ill because of sporting events. But partly of that is, like, how could I let this make me feel like this? But, like, there is something about, one, you are, you know, you're watching something that's taking place off Twitter. But also, like, the world of sports is so fun and nonsensical. Yeah. Where, you know, you have somebody like Kevin Durant just randomly tweeting about how he'll ne never log off. And then it's like, I, if you can't find joy in that, I don't know what, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. I was going to say sports is a great example of a, like a place online where you can have sort of healthier engagement right. and sort of like. Well, the, sometimes what? then there are moments um, <laughs> I'm reminded of uh, there was this terrible year in which Florida State was um, a national championship contender, but there had been a number of sexual assault allegations against their quarterback at the time, Jameis Winston, and it became to the point that there is kind of this like catchphrase called talking about the Knowles, where if you said anything about Florida State, you would have the meanest, worst people in the history of time invade your mentions. This, I think this was like, this was the first time I think a lot of people were like, oh, you can harass people on this platform pretty effectively. And that's, yeah. for a lot of sports people, that's when we first started seeing it. And then, like, Gamergate happened, and then the 2016 election happened. But there were moments where you're like, oh, this, this thing that we've been using for fun can be so quickly weaponized. The second we talk about something in s adjacent to sports that is hard and bad. Well, I was going to say, I think in, in, in 2016 sort of, fueled this too but the political battlefield and i think the internet fuels this as well the political battle battlefield has now expanded and crept into every corner of our lives right. like it's almost it's, it's into sports now and it's into entertainment and it is it's at the oscar you know like it's, it is very hard to talk about anything now that politics doesn't creep into and i i do think the internet has helped fuel that which brings me back to sort of the original question about like there's a lot of debate team energy around politics right now and especially uh, conversations online about politics. Like, how do we inject more academic team energy into our political conversations? I think that by being curious and asking questions, um, there are so many times in which you see um, there was a statement that went out yesterday um, from Ohio Right to Life with regard of the, to a case, um, the horrifying case of a 10-year-old who was raped mm -hmm. and um, pregnant and the entire right wing decided that she did not exist and wasn't real. Right. And I, the statement said something about, like, she, des you know, she deserved better than an abortion. And at no point, and granted it was a press statement, but I wanted someone to ask, like, like what? Right. Asking questions and being willing to be wrong in public, I think, are two of 
the bravest things that people can possibly do. Now, I'm aware, like, there's kind of the whole t- the Twitter concept of uh, jacking off, just asking questions, where it's just <laughs> sort of like, at a certain point, you're like, mm, why are you asking a sh- whole lot of questions about uh, Israel right. in a way that um, I don't feel good about at all. Right. But, like, there are moments for asking actual questions. And if you don't, if you, you, the answers can be telling in so many different ways. And so I think that, what I learned from academic team is one, I'm really good at trivia. Two, <laughs> I'm again really good at trivia. If you live in DC and would like at any point someone to go to bar trivia with, I will go. I'm finally old enough that I'm good enough at DC bar trivia, which is very difficult because everyone in DC got a PhD. Yeah, they're all yeah, um, a bunch of, bunch of nerds there. But I think that asking questions and being willing to be wrong is so important. And I, I want to note something though that, um, you said that like politics is everywhere. And I think we actually just did an episode of my show, The Argument, uh, in, a little bit on, this, argu- on this, this idea. But I think that there are lots of people for whom politics was in ha- like part of their lives anyway. Mm. You know, politics is how I, how I got married. Right. Politics is how my parents got married. Um, like there, there are people whose lives are l- relatively free of, pol- of political conversations or of politics, or of politics having a real lasting impact on their lives. And, you know, that would be great, and I'm sure it's amazing. And I would totally understand why they're like, why are people talking about politics in my life? Um, But for many people, that was never, there was never any choice about that. There was, like, for, you know, whether it's the right to vote, or whether it's the right to marry, or where you get to live, and how much money you get to have while you live there, what where think you know if you are there are a host of people in America for whom political decisions have been the means by which they have been able to experience America yeah. um a you know a country of which I'm extremely fond in the same way that you are fond of a relative who is weird but you know you get it you understand there's a context it's weird i think for that very reason because politics is so deeply important to so many people and has been for so long and 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 affects like just the way that they live their lives and the way that they uh, go about the world like it can't be about just process and performance and like there has to be a way to have arguments about politics and have debates about politics that aren't right. sort of the performative bullshit stuff that we see online. Yeah, I think if you can have arguments about the, the results of politics, like what do you mm. actually want to happen? Yeah. Don't make it about like, oh, I don't like the process of this because at a certain point you're like, well, you know. Right. Like, are you mad about the process or are you mad about the result of the process? Right. And I think that it's interesting how people try to split the baby on that. And so I think that, like, think about what you actually want to take place. Think about the process that that will take to get there. And yes, there are processes where, like, I know there are lots of political, there are lots of ideas I support where if someone did it by fiat, I'd be kind of upset about, even if the result I liked. But, like, think about, think about the ends. Right. Think about how we're going to, ha- you know, how you want to get there. What are the what are you willing to do to get there? What are you not willing to do to get there? I think that, that that's really especially important on issues like climate change, where people will say, like, this is so important to me. But it is also really important to me that I can pay rent and that get to work and all of these things. And like I understand that that's incredibly irritating for people who are like, no, this is something we have to deal with right now. Make the case. Make the case and find means by which you can find some me- some compromise if that's possible. I will also say that the fetishization of compromise is bad because there are certain things upon which you can't really just divide by two and get an answer. That like you don't just get the true. median that on a certain on a bunch of issues. But like on a lot of things, if it's fixing a bridge or building affordable housing or something like that, like you're going to have different sides. They are going to be very mad at each other. But it, either politics is the means by which no one is happy, but something gets done. Well, and uh, yeah, I always go back to, we're all stuck here together, right? Yeah. 
There's 300 yeah, that's it. plus million of us in this country. We're all stuck here together. We got to figure out a way to make it work, or else it's not going to work. Right now, it's not working right. that well. But like, but like the one of the answer isn't to like get rid of the half that doesn't. You know, it's like yeah. we got to figure out a way to make it work. That's it. That's that's the way it is. Exactly, and especially because I think that I'm always impressed by when it does work. Like I, um, I'm kind of upset. Like I've become recently kind of obsessed by like successful local construction projects where you know dc city council said they wanted something and then this happened and it had built and then it's here and i'm like hey they did it yeah. it's wild when you get little tiny examples of government working as efficiently as it should <laughs> you're like oh you did the thing like you did the thing or you responded to the crisis with the thing and like i mean even just little things about like if you go to a new place and all the roads that got you there generally worked and things were okay. Like, congrats. Like that was decades of work to get you to that point. Congratulations. So I think like, you know, I, I when people say all politics is local, I think more politics should be local, mm. especially because that's where you can see that politics isn't just a fun game for weirdos. It can actually, it's what it's supposed to be is to get you somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Um, Last question I ask all our guests, uh, what's your favorite way to unplug and how often do you get to do it? Uh, my favorite way to unplug is to work out like a crazed maniac. Um, I work out for about like an hour and a half, two hours a day. Wow. Um, I am now, now, I'm that impressed. sounds impressive, yeah. but it is also, sometimes I'm like, hmm, this is lightly concerning, um, <laughs> but I really do enjoy it. I've written before that... Um, I really like workouts that are hard and terrible. And if you tell me about a workout that is hard and terrible, I'm like, oh, I'm going to try and do it. So please don't suggest things because otherwise I'm going to, I will, it, it'll, you heard her folks. Bad. Send, send those workouts to Jane. <laughs> you can send them to the yeah, offline. We'll, um, we'll pass them along. Oh, uh, no, no. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I work out a lot. Um, I go for walks. I watch like Ken Burns documentaries. Um, yeah, I'm, Wow. Even just even just listing that out, I'm like, oh no. I'm just I'm really leaning headlong and becoming a sixty two year old man. <laughs> I like it. Uh Jane Coaston, thank you for joining offline. This was fun. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.